San Francisco is one of the most recognizable cities in California and in the United States as a whole. Complete with one of the most iconic monuments on the West Coast, it's safe to say that this city has been important for as long as it's been a part of America. However, in more recent times, the city has struggled, ravaged by poverty, crime, and the cost of living that would shock any down-to-earth person. So how did things become this way? And is this San Francisco's first struggle as a city? Stay tuned to find out, as today we explore the rise and fall of San Francisco, the Paris of the Pacific. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Let's start at the beginning. The land that is now San Francisco has been inhabited by Native Americans since 3000 BC, but was first explored by the Spanish in 1542 when Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo arrived in the modern day San Francisco Bay. Still, no Europeans would actually make landfall for a few hundred years. By 1769, England and Russia expanded into the Pacific, and this was cause for significant alarm to the Spanish crown. So when Gaspar de Portola arrived in the bay once more, he made it a point of underlying the area's existence, and hence an excursion was planned to occupy the region. The Viceroyalty of Baleo sent out an expedition led by one commander, Bucarely, into the Pacific Northwest, outfitted with Spanish soldiers and missionaries. However, providing this many troops caused issues with supplies, which delayed the expedition, and it was during these delays that reports came in of English and French explorers in the area. That, on top of Russia's colonization of Alaska, made the commander extremely worried. In response, he sent two scouting parties to the site in 1772 to find a water route to the area through the Sacramento River. Two years later, the expeditions were deemed failures. In response, a push was made to create a colony to occupy the entirety of the bay before any other foreign powers could. On December the 16th, 1774, the settlement was approved and established the next year, and in 1776, the same year as the creation of the union it would eventually join, the city of San Francisco was born. In 1821, the Spanish Empire was collapsing. Their crown jewel, Mexico, had recently won independence and was declared a republic. And as the idea of manifest destiny began to catch on in the minds of Americans, settlers began arriving in mass to the region despite it still belonging to Mexico. Historically speaking, American settlers arriving in a foreign land rarely ends well for the owners of said land. By the 1840s, the once small numbers of incoming American settlers had increased greatly. The local Mexican government couldn't manage them anymore. These Mexican locals, known as Californios, had helped many of the immigrants cross the Sierra Desert, but now began struggling with these new settlers. California lifestyle was largely agrarian and laid back, and while that could be found sparsely in American culture, the American entrepreneurial spirit clashed with these customs. There were other conflicts, however. There was a bigger issue for the Californios. While Californios continued living as they had, Mexican leadership came and went in constant political turmoil. With every new governor, there were new policies and new approaches. Not to mention, California was far away from Mexico City, and given Mexico's political situation of the time, they were on their own for the most part. The United States may have been distant, but they were much more organized than the Mexican government and were also more tolerant of their lifestyles, despite the attitudes of the incoming Americans. All in all, the Californios became increasingly more receptive to the prospect of joining the United States. So when the Mexican-American War came to California in 1846, the Californios capitulated without a fight. A lot of turmoil ensued, but the result was the declaration of the California Republic of Sonoma, just to the east of San Francisco. It was briefly independent before being annexed by the United States after 25 days, allowing both Californios and Americans to live in the Union as equals. At this point, San Francisco had around 800 residents, which was quite large considering its surroundings. However, that would quickly change as the gold rush was coming. 
In 1848, a water mill was being built in the modern-day Coloma, around 50 miles from Sacramento. A carpenter working on this mill named James W. Marshall saw abnormal sparkles in the stream bed of the American River. These sparkles were gold. This was the beginning of the California Gold Rush, one of the most transformative events in Western American history and acted as an inspiration worldwide. Considering that Europe was rocked by revolutions in 1848, there was both a desire to leave and an incentive to come to America, and hundreds of thousands of people took that opportunity. By August, there were around 4,000 prospectors in the area searching for their prized metal. In the year afterwards, an enormous wave of immigrants, dubbed the 49ers, jumped that number up to 80,000. By 1853, the incoming immigrants peaked at 250,000, all looking for a chance to strike gold in the fields of California. These new residents excavated an estimated 2 billion US dollars worth of gold throughout the gold rush, but very few prospectors left the rush wealthier than they entered it. Considering the lack of pleasant conditions on the frontier, many people threw in the towel. As the deposits ran dry, mechanization took over manual labor, and law enforcement arrived, the mining camps evolved into settlements. The gold rush gradually died down, and by the end of the decade, the last veins had run dry. The prospectors were left without a reason to stay in the region and began to look elsewhere. But surprise, surprise, gold is rare. And since going all the way back home with their empty pockets didn't sound very nice, many of these miners became permanent residents of the area. This was a pinnacle moment as before the gold rush, California had a population around 160,000 most of which were Native Americans. By the middle of the 1850s, 300,000 people in total decided to call California their new home. The gold rush had a global reach, as settlers came from Europe, South America, and as far away as China. Many of these settlers called San Francisco their home, making it a particularly significant location. This was San Francisco's first period of major development, but it would not be the last. This next chapter is where our story becomes a bit more intense, reminding me that as cities fall, we should all be prepared for challenges in our personal lives. And when you have people who depend on you, it's crucial to have good life insurance. Thanks to Policy Genius, the sponsor of this video, you can put your worries to rest. Policy Genius makes finding the right policy simple. You contact their licensed, award winning agents to find a custom solution to your needs. What I like best about this process is that they work for you, not the insurance companies, so you don't have to worry about bias towards one company over another. I'd also add that relying on employers for your long-term security might not be enough, so it's a good idea to take matters into your own hands. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million in coverage. Some options offer same-day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius knows how valuable your time is, and their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest prices. Policy Genius is for parents, caregivers, and anyone else who has people who depend on them. They simplify the process of getting life insurance so you can protect the people you love, so it's no wonder they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net. You deserve a more innovative way to find and buy it. So head to policygenius.com slash its history or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you can save. Thank you, Policy Genius, for supporting the channel. And now, back to the story of San Francisco. As San Francisco grew to be one of the biggest locations on the West Coast, the issue of slavery was tearing the nation apart. California, being so distant from the war, was mostly left to its own devices. Many modern depictions of this period like to paint California firmly in the Union camp, but that's not exactly true. It had several secessionist voices in its community. While not many were prevalent due to their secrecy, there were several judges, assemblymen, and other local government figures impeached and sometimes even arrested 
for treasonable language. San Francisco was of dire importance to the Union during the Civil War, regardless of the divisiveness of the ongoing conflict. Due to the threat of Confederate sympathizing raiders and privateers, the U.S. Pacific Squadron centered its defense of the West Coast in San Francisco mere months after the critical 1860 election. By January of 1861, two artillery companies were stationed in Fort Vancouver and Fort Point, located on either side of the mouth of the bay around where the Golden Gate Bridge now makes landfall on both sides, a topic that you might recall from our previous video. Anyhow, another fortress of note was Alcatraz Island, not yet a prison. It was particularly heavily armored with 120 soldiers and 10,000 pounds of gunpowder ready to go in bombproof magazines. When the Confederates fired on Fort Sumter, California as a whole pledged to the Union. Though several alleged secessionist plots kept the Union forces and loyalists on alert. Despite the armaments around the city, defense for San Francisco itself remained something of a concept. You see, by September of 1864, Fort Alcatraz reported that its storehouses were too few, its prisoners were too many, with its water supply too unstable should an enemy attack. After the Trent Affair, where Union troops seized Confederate diplomats on board the British ship Trent, the San Francisco garrison began fearing an attack from English warships. A frequent request from the garrison was to position the famous USS Independence in the harbor, as it was the only ship suitable for heavy guns. Well, they would not receive independence, reinforcement from the Navy would arrive in the harbor to defend San Francisco. As the war continued, defenses for the city increased, including the placement of artillery on Angel Island, but the defenders and residents still did not feel properly defended. Even as the Union took Richmond and ended the Civil War, the garrison still felt inadequate. They feared waterway rebels assaulting the city and continuing the war from the place the Union could not reach. However, San Francisco's biggest threat came from within the city. Throughout the Civil War, there was regular street violence between citizens with Loyalist and Secessionist sympathies. The 1864 wartime election was a particularly ugly time for the city, with supporters of the deal with the Confederacy regularly marching at night with torches. The Unionist reaction to this was so violent that the San Francisco police had to raise a so-called police battalion of 200 men to counter the vigilantes. The street violence came to a head after the death of President Lincoln, as Southern sympathizers caught celebrating were beaten. A newspaper with a pro-Southern platform had its office raided and destroyed, and the garrison at Fort Alcatraz had to march out to restore order. After these events, things settled down as that dark period in American history came to a close and San Francisco came into its prime. San Francisco continued to grow through the end of the 1800s, especially after the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. It was during this period that many new neighborhoods were developed, including the Western Edition, the Haight-Ashbury, Eureka Valley, and the Mission District. The city's iconic cable cars also began running at this time, and some argue that this is when the city took on its modern cultural identity, as writers such as Mark Twain and Oscar Wilde arrived. However, on March the 6th, 1900, a body was found. That body belonged to Chick Jim, a Chinese man who was the first victim of an epidemic striking San Francisco. The disease had quite a reputation. It was the bubonic plague, the same Black Death that had wiped out a third of Europe's population 450 years earlier. However, this was the 1900s America. Hence, a quarantine was instated in the Chinatown district of San Francisco, but was lifted and then reinstated multiple times. A quarantine was not to continue, as the city's courts viewed it not to be necessary. To quote Philip A. Kalish, on June the 15th, 18 days after the health board had imposed the second quarantine, Judge Morrow ordered it lifted. He based his ruling on grounds that the measure was radically discriminatory and too drastic to meet the conditions for suppressing a contagious disease. In this decision, Morrow attempted to clarify the situation by publicly stating that the plague did not exist in San Francisco. He announced, 
Personally, the evidence in this case seems to be sufficient to establish the fact that the bubonic plague has not existed and does not exist in San Francisco. As the plague worsened, California's governor, Henry Gage, actively suppressed information about the San Francisco plague. This was not popular, not even among Americans. Quoting again, the Occidental Medical Times indignantly observes that the governor had openly endeavored to suppress every fact in connection with the existence of plague in San Francisco. The question was national and international. It declared that the suppression of news was, quote, a crime against civilization, an outrageous piece of selfishness on the part of our metropolis, in which the interests of the state and the nation are wholly disgusted. By 1901, the issue could no longer be kept under wraps. The state appointed a plague commission, and despite this, plague denial continued for years, with over 120 confirmed cases and 119 known deaths. Well, that may not seem like a lot, this was the first plague outbreak that the United States had ever experienced, and the suppression of information related to it led to strains of the plague escaping San Francisco, causing it to spread to several other states when it could have been stopped. While the plague ended in 1904, the city wasn't out of the woods quite yet. On April the 18th, 1906, a magnitude 7.9 earthquake struck the city. Considering that San Francisco rests directly on the San Andreas Fault, earthquakes on the California coast are particularly extreme. Damage to the city was universal. The initial quake killed hundreds, but as it was with the plague, the Chinese population's death were not properly recorded. Unlike before though, we still don't know the exact numbers, we just know that it was over 3,000. The real damage was yet to come, as fires followed the earthquakes. Over 30 fires tore through the city, destroying another 25,000 buildings in over 490 blocks. Among the destroyed buildings were a college, the Hall of Records, and City Hall. As the city recovered from this, they began to flourish even more, recovering in less than a decade, just in time to celebrate the opening of the Panama Canal. By 1937, the Golden Gate Bridge opened and Fort Alcatraz became the infamous prison island. San Francisco was also important to the American Pacific operations in World War II, which unfortunately led to another ugly period of racial discrimination, this time to Japanese Americans. Quoting Kevin L. Leonard, one Japanese American woman who worked domestically recalled that even the people that I worked for treated me and talked to me as though I was my own father who was piloting those planes out there in Pearl Harbor. And it was this type of fear mongering that led to a decision to evacuate more than 110,000 people of Japanese descent from their Pacific Coast homes. Anyhow, the Treaty of San Francisco officially ended the war with Japan and established peaceful relationships six years after World War II had ended. From here, San Francisco's development exploded for a third time. Unlike last time when it was recovering from the earthquake and fires, this time it would reach for the skies. While there had been a few skyscrapers constructed in the late 1940s and early 1950s, the 1960s saw a massive wave of buildings completely transforming the city's skyline. Its restructuring was largely influenced by a global effort to make the West Coast port into a center of commerce, finance, and administration to command the whole world. By the 1990s, San Francisco's business district was earned the name the Wall Street of the West. And while it wasn't nearly as big as New York's business district, it was an undeniably important center of finance, both regionally and internationally, largely due to the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange, the Federal Reserve Bank, the Transamerica Corporation, and a slew of insurance companies and brokerage firms. This was San Francisco's height. But with the turn of the millennia, the boom ended. Tens of thousands left the city as work began to stagnate, but the city's economy stabilized by 2003 as new businesses began to populate the Bay Area. Silicon Valley, one of the tech capitals of the world, is located just south of the city, and it has a massive gravitational pull. By 2013, it had fully recovered from the 2007 Great Recession, 
And despite current events, the city is still doing better than it was in earlier decades. So we should acknowledge that in spite of its faults, the city is in a rare position. Most cities in America only enjoy a single period of major growth and development. While San Francisco, on the other hand, had three. One after the gold rush, one after the earthquake, and a third after World War II. It's a world leader in tech, as it's the biggest city near the headquarters of companies behind Google, Facebook, Netflix, Apple, and many, many more. YouTube was built in San Francisco, and since Google owns it, its home is still nearby. So perhaps San Francisco has fallen on hard times, but considering how low it's been in the past, it's not a stretch of the imagination to say that great things may be in the future for the Paris of the Pacific. Thank you all so much for watching. I'd love to hear your opinions on this story in the comments section, and feel free to send me your video ideas over on Instagram. Until next time, I'm Ryan Sokash, signing off.